We are going to get started with the lunch. I'm just going to make a quick uh, welcoming remark and thank all of you for attending um, uh, this program uh, today. And uh, I am really delighted. I, I, I've been traveling, so this is one of the first program I'm uh, here hosting in in a few uh, in a few months. And and especially excited that we're hosting this particular program. That when we first talked about it, uh, uh, when I was uh, meeting uh, Professor uh, Li Cheng um, shortly after, I think it was in July when we were talking about this program, and uh, we're talking about APEC uh, 2023 and the Asia Pacific. Um, climate. And uh, when we were planning this, when we were talking about this, uh, Chen had just moved to Hong Kong and, uh, and, and we were, you know, I you just think about July and now it's only a few months, but our world has changed so much. And just in this last couple of weeks has changed even more. And, uh, and even though the APEC uh, uh, conference that's uh, the it's going to happen in Seattle. I'm sorry, in San Francisco in about a month. Um, it has it'll be very interesting. I think we're all speculating who's going to be there. Uh, and well, one person who's going to if he's going to be there or not. Um, but I think it is a really timely subject, and I'm so glad um, uh, many of you can join us. Also on Asia Society uh, Hong Kong's website. There, other centers have done um, a similar program on APEC. So feel free to check out our Asia Society global website. I believe um, our centers in, in San Francisco, Seattle, and others um, have done or will be doing more program on this topic. But here in Hong Kong, we're doing it really from a Hong Kong and Asia perspective, uh, uh, what to expect. Uh, and we have two of our um, a scholar in residence being part of the program, and I want to thank them. Uh, Chen has agreed to be uh, one of our scholar in resident, as well as uh, all, our old friend, uh, Professor Al Reyes. And uh, so Al will help moderate the discussion, and then we're really delighted to have um, uh, Monica um, uh, Whaley, president of the National Center for APEC, joining us from Seattle, and she's going to be online. And uh, so the discussion will start. We'll to have lunch first, and then uh, Al will get the program started. But I wanted to again thank you all, and if you have an opportunity, um, check out uh, all the activity that you know you saw. Um, we are going to be having Kurt Tong back uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the former uh, U.S. Consul General in uh, Hong Kong. He will be in Hong Kong, and we're going to be hosting a program with him on October 31st. And last time he was here, when he left, his farewell address was here with us uh, July 2nd, when I had an opportunity to interview him. And we're really delighted to hear, to have Kurt with us uh, to talk about what's happening. Uh, and again, he probably can shed some light on what's going to be happening with APEC from the U.S. perspective, since now he's based in Washington, D.C. So please join us. And if you are not a member yet, um, please consider being uh, um, uh, part of the membership of Asia Society because we will have programs that are just going to be for members only and especially if you're a President Circle member um, we will have a lot of really interesting programs that are just off the record uh, and that can have really a great discussion uh, that is uh, closed door and um, and so I would highly recommend those of you who are interested many of you uh, who are already President Circle member I want to thank you and because I think this is a really critical time and it's um, we need to to talk and learn from each other and um, and continue. And I think Hong Kong has this unique role. Um, I think we are still the most global city among of the Chinese cities um, with with uh, a lot of the organizations and, and the expatriate community, as well as think tanks like uh, the one that Professor Chen is going to Chen is going to be uh, uh, running um, at Hong Kong U. So I think this is critical time for Hong Kong to step up and uh, and and which we have already played that role. So I'm really glad that Asia Society Hong Kong uh, is part of that um, that that network. And and I want to thank you all for your support and enjoy your lunch. And uh, and if you have time, go check out the exhibition at our gallery. It's a wonderful artist. Uh, from Taiwan, but originally from China, uh, uh, Master Pan Jun. He's 87 years old, and he's still painting. And his wonderful artwork uh, in the uh, the gallery, Chantel Miller Gallery, half the painting in the gallery um, were painted uh, in 2023. And that just shows you the vitality of this this uh, brilliant Chinese um, uh, Chinese painter uh, who will be coming back to do um, some interesting program with us. So stay tuned. 
And, uh, but again, enjoy your lunch and we look forward to seeing you at future Asia Society Hong Kong program. Thank you. Hi, us. Hi. Hello. <laughs> you can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I think we're thank all you. set. So thank you very much everyone for, for joining um, this uh, luncheon to discuss uh, APEC uh, 2023 and the Asian business landscape. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here to thank um, Alice and her team at Asia Society Hong Kong Center, uh, particularly Holly I've been working with uh, to organize this event. So thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is I will introduce um, our panelists and then I'll just set a, a bit of a framing for our discussion. And then um, we'll have a bit of a back and forth with uh, Monica Chung and myself, and then open the discussion to you all. So please um, be ready for some questions. Um, so I was a journalist for about 13 years, uh, working mainly for a magazine called Asia Week Magazine. And frankly, I went to too many APEC meetings for my liking, because uh, it was not a very much sought after assignment to go to an APEC meeting, because lots of folks didn't even know what it was, right? And uh, Gareth Evans, the former uh, foreign minister of Australia, used to describe the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. It doesn't even have a I mean, what is it? APEC, right? Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, as four nouns in search of a verb, right? Is the way he used to describe it, or four adjectives in search of a noun. I, I can't remember, but he basically he said, well, he was quite cutting uh, about what APEC was. Twenty-one economies, and I use the word economies because it's kind of important to understand that in the context of APEC, there are no countries. There are there are no flags. Only the United States and Russia insist on using flags. You, you, you just watch it if you're, if you're a, a aficionado like myself, uh, looking at the limousines. Only the United States and Russia will have uh, their national flags on the limousines. All the other countries abide by the rules, which is that there are no nation national flags uh, in APEC. APEC is also in. Uh, unusual in that it's a grouping that includes um, Hong Kong, so we're there as Hong Kong, China, um, and Taiwan as Chinese Taipei. So that underscores that it's all about econom economies rather than countries or member states. Uh, that's very important because within the context of whatever discussions there are, um, the leaders are there as economic leaders. So it's the APEC economic leaders meeting. This is kind of basic for those of you who are already involved, but it's it's kind of an important um, aspect to understand. Um, I would just say, make one point about why APEC after, uh, it, it was started in 1989. So you do the math, 34 years in existence. And maybe for most of you, having the APEC business card, travel card, might be the only sort of tangible um, result from APEC that you might think about. Um, but there's, there are many other things that have happened in, the, um, in these many years. Um, one of them was in 1993, Bill Clinton elevated APEC to the leaders level when APEC, the United States hosted APEC, say, say in 1993 at Blake Island in uh, off Seattle, I believe it's. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, you we have Bill Clinton and the United States to thank for bringing APEC to that very important level, economic leaders level. And so whenever the United States does host APEC, it's a big deal. It just means that the biggest economy in the world wants to do something or has um, an agenda, if you will, in the Asia Pacific. 
The last time the United States hosted APEC was in 2011 in Hawaii. Uh, the Obama administration was hosting. And so the current administration, Biden administration, is now hosting in 2023 in San Francisco. So it's an important meeting, and we have to kind of understand to some extent what does it actually mean and what's the agenda. Um, the main point I would like to say is that in a world of decoupling, and there's no denying that there's some kind of disengagement going on um, between the United States and China for the most part, that it does mean that organizations or frameworks or mechanisms that actually bring countries or economies together, in my mind, become more important, particularly if they include the United States and China in them. So whatever you might think about the effectiveness of the G20, say, or indeed now of APEC, uh, it is a forum that brings together these two great powers, poles, or whatever you, whatever you, however you might want to describe them, but it also brings a lot of other players right, who are important in their own way. In a decoupling world, the key is how these players that I, I call them caught in the middle economies, caught in the middle countries, how they pivot to one or the other, how much agency do they have? What, are, what is their ability, their capacity to hinge from say, connecting with China or connecting with the United States? And in a forum like APEC, in a forum like the G20, um, indeed in a big forum like the United States, I think this is very important that in some ways our multipolar world is not necessarily about the poles. It may indeed be about the countries in the middle and how, of which there are many, many, and how they are able to hinge between those two great powers. Now, I'm not saying that this will all become clear in San Francisco in a month's time, but I think the dynamic is there. And this is in some ways how we un should understand an institution, an organization like APEC, and why, in some ways, having a forum where China and the United States are together is in some ways much more important than it has been, even though the narrative might be that there are so many other um, trade and investment uh, organizations, they are frameworks that are now much more important or more favored. And I can name so many like CPTPP, RCEP, uh, the um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, IPEF. Uh, there are many of these arrangements now that um, have emerged in our decoupling world. Um, but APEC remains. And what we're going to do here is try to understand why, in some ways, it's much more important uh, today because of its multi Pole, uh, multilateral aspect, the fact that it has the United States and China in it, as well as other key players. I cannot think of anyone more able to um, give us a perspective of what all that means than Monica Hardy Whaley, who is joining us from Seattle. Now, I, her, her bio is, 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 is quite extensive and uh, is on the, on the flyer, but I'll just highlight that Monica is president of the National Center for APEC and has been with NC APEC since the center's founding after the first ever APEC leaders meeting that took place in Seattle in 1993. So NC APEC is the home of the APEC 2023 USA Private Sector Host Committee the U.S. Secretariat for the Pacific Basin Pacific Economic Cooperation Council (U.S. PEC), the Secretariat for the U.S. Appointees to the APEC Business Advisory Council (ABAC), and Pacific Summit Resources LLC, which partners with APEC host economies to produce the annual APEC CEO Summit programs. She holds a bachelor's degree 
in political science and French from the University of Santa Clara and studied in Paris at the Institut d'études politiques uh, Sciences Po. And joining us too, right here, my friend and colleague uh, Li Chang is professor of political science and founding director of the Center on Contemporary China and the World at the University of Hong Kong. Dr. Li's, sorry, this is, I really should have a, a, an iPad, but Dr. Li's research areas include the transformation of political leaders, the Chinese middle class, technological development in China, Sino-US relations, and global governance. Um, Cheng Li is the author and editor of 17 books, including more recently, Middle Class Shanghai, Reshaping US-China Engagement, The Power of Ideas, The Rising Influence of Thinkers and Think Tanks in China, and Chinese Politics in the Xi Jinping Era. Um, Professor Lee uh, received an MA in Asian Studies from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD in Political Science from Princeton University. So thank you very much, Monica, for joining us and thank you, Chang, for being here. So Monica, let me turn to you because you're right there and coming to us at a probably most inconvenient hour, but we really appreciate <laughs> it. Um, tell us what uh, what has been on the U.S. APEC 2023 agenda that we here should know about? What and what are some of the um, issues that have come up in the U.S. A APEC year? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, um, inviting me to come. It's quite an honor. And this is the fourth Asia Society location I have semi-visited. Um, so very, very pleased to add this to the new, brand new Seattle office and the San Francisco office, as well as headquarters in New York. So just uh, really pleased to be here. Um, one of the things that it, the National Center focuses on the private sector interaction with APEC. So I always look at things through that lens. Uh, we did that in... Seattle in 1993, tried to bring the private sector together, and the center was started as a, a, a permanent way to give the private sector um, a shoehorn for APEC. So at the time, there weren't very many opportunities for the private sector. Over the years, this has grown you know, substantially with the APEC Business Advisory Council and many ministerials having private sector interactions as a normalized part of the ministerial agenda. Um, so this has been something that over the years has grown grown very fast. And the U.S., uh, the White House this year, is really focusing on this CEO summit, this private sector interaction, as a way to demonstrate its three main themes, which are uh, interconnected, so building a resilient and interconnected region, um, innovative, which is enabling, obviously, an innovative environment um, to, to build a sustainable future for all, and inclusive. So they're really focusing on this area of inclusivity and building an equitable and um, inclusive future for all. So they they really are trying to get to hit those issues. And so in the CEO summit function, we are focusing on sustainability, inclusion, resilience, and innovation. And so the all of the and the and the APEC Business Advisory Councils are uh, themes are equity sustainability and opportunity. So you'll hear a lot of the same threads through all of those thematic um, leads that that have, uh, that each of the parts of US APEC hosting have, have put out. Um, so sustainability is a very big portion of it. And the US has come out, uh, came out very, very early, in fact, at the very end of last year at the first informal senior officials meeting, which was held in Honolulu um, at the East West Center there, and uh, it is they came out with an agenda called the Manoa Agenda for Sustainable and Inclusive, inclusive Economics, and that economy, sorry, excuse me, um, building partnerships to implement the Bangkok goals on the biocircular green economy. So they started with where Bangkok uh, left off. There was an agreement on this um, on the biocircular green economy by all the leaders of APEC, and they were uh, they wanted to figure out how then do you implement that agenda from Bangkok and do it with partnerships with the private sector. So from the very beginning of this year, the, the private sector interaction uh, has been a key part of what they're, they've been doing. The other, at the trade minister's meeting at mid-year in, in May in Detroit, Michigan, 
they came out with the um, the digital Pacific agenda, which focused on all the ways in which new technologies and, and the digital world and AI and all these other elements really do build uh, an inclusive and, and form inclusive links between people. And they're um, using a lot the, the examples we learned from COVID where there are a lot of small businesses which actually survived and stayed alive and, and were resilient uh, because of their ability to get online and to do business uh, through the digital digital channels. Um, and finally, the, in the end, they, they're focusing on um, at this the third uh, senior officials meeting in Seattle, all of the different ministerials focused on resilience. Uh, we had an, a ministerial on small and medium enterprises, the Women in Economy Forum, uh, and we're trying to, to identify ways, especially for SMEs, to have a resilient uh, structure so that as whatever disruptions come our way, and we all know they come periodically in different forms, uh, but that resilience is built in. And that um, is something that you know, the APEC Business Advisory Council is also working on. They, they created a framework for uh, SME resilience and supply chains, uh, for supply chain resilience. And it's uh, just these themes of Sustainability, inclusion, resilience, and innovation really are are threaded through all of the uh, U.S. APEC work this year. Thank you very much, um, Monica. Um, if I might, um, when you these days when we talk about catchphrases and words like um, resilience, um, often they're polite ways of trying to say other things. Uh, <laughs> So something like resilience, one man's decoupling is another man's resilience. You know, I mean, in other words, and 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 geopolitics, like it or not, are now impinging on many of these discussions. What I call the weaponization of everything, everywhere, all at once. Right. So that something like supply chains have become very geopoliticized, if I put it that way. And that's why we have the term decoupling, which the Europeans have politely now tried to use the word de-risking. Um, to some extent, when we had the G7 meeting earlier this year, there was a focus on very much the de-risking aspect with no holds barred in terms of just plain saying, well, China and Russia, we're trying to de-risk from them, decouple from them. Um, tell me, how does, how does the United States or how has the United States been trying to square the circle or circle the square this year when you're talking essentially in a room that includes China and adversaries, Russia is there too, but you're trying to talk about some issues where we know the United States, uh, where it stands in terms of its approach, where, you know, just even in the last year or so, measures are taken to restrict certain trade with China or to impose sanctions on Russia or what have you. Um, how does that, how has that APEC discussion then become relevant or is it irrelevant or at worst, is it just simply least common denominator approaches that just to be devil's advocate don't really mean a hell of a lot? Sorry, I don't mean to be. No, that's all right. No, but that's fine. Believe me, this is not, not the first time I've been asked that question, yeah. but it's, um, the, it goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning about the value of APEC being this channel of regular meetings and communications, not just between leaders once a year, but this is a process that goes on throughout the year and deals with very practical things like the APEC business travel card or customs or uh, standards, these, these very nuts and bolts elements of doing business in the region and keeping economies growing and thriving. And I think 
there's always, of course, at the big meeting at the end of the year, an effort to have a, a chapeau on there or some kind of something you can uh, look to to say this is the theme, this is the deliverable for this year, but really the deliverables of the year go throughout the year. And I think some of the conversations that APEC has had, just taking this sort of digital area as an example, when we first discussed uh, data flows, free data flows in the um, in the APEC Business Advisory Council, I think it was six or seven years ago, and the the immediate reaction was sort of fearfulness and that you know we can't possibly have these data flows crossing borders because this is this is strange. We don't understand it. We don't want to, um, we don't want our our information going elsewhere. We want control. And I think um, one of the things that the ABAC, the business community did is try to um, familiarize and to socialize the idea of uh, of data flows in such a way that it was not to show that it's really a foundation for making business work. It really has to exist. And so there's uh, we had examples of connected cows and, and different ways, different industry sectors were using data flows that then translates or later on sort of starts forming into AI and the same kinds of discussions that are being had about artificial intelligence and how it's it's either already here and ubiquitous or it's very scary and ahead of us and uh, or it's the answer to all of our prayers. And so uh, whether no matter where you stand on that issue, the idea that APEC has a regular place to convene and to have these conversations, uh, and I think in a in a non-binding consensus based format, allows it to be kind of a test kitchen, um, an, an innovative lab of these ideas and where they can start, especially in those areas where there is not already, um, you know, global rules of trade that are that are very firm. Um, things like sustainability, there's a lot that we're working on in APEC that the economies, even those that you named that we don't always agree with everything on, all of us tend to agree on the issue of the need to, to save the planet and to, you know, to address climate change and to, uh, find a way to get to these sort of net zero goals. So I think there is there's plenty of things we're working on that are of common interest, not co lowest common denominator, but common interest where we can forge the way ahead and find best practices and, in a way that is um, that facilitates this continued connection between all of these economies. Because I firmly believe that having that connection there right. is is critically important. And I would then argue just that your in some ways, and what you do and what your colleagues do with regard to the ABAC, and uh, for those who might not be, uh, know the a APEC Business Advisory Council, each member economy, so each of the 21 member economies nominates three uh, business leaders from the economy to be part of this APEC Business Advisory Council. In theory, the three should be one from big business, one from sort of medium sized and one small, but that doesn't always happen, right? <laughs> but I mean, in theory, it's it's supposed to work out that way. But uh, um, uh, so in many ways, that kind of work, the APEC work that involves the private sector in the current environment in which we live in, the geopolitically charged environment becomes more important. I would absolutely agree. I think that um, the the winds of politics go back and forth, but businesses tend to to want to get back together and and talk about how you continue business moving, how you continue to move people and goods and financial uh, uh, sorry financial um, what's the word I'm looking for transactions uh, transactions etc. Just to write it I mean, to move these things freely yeah. and smoothly in a in a unified commercial environment, then the politics, that which still is going to happen on the margins and has happened throughout APEX history, various of the economies have been at loggerheads with one another over different things at different times, almost every year, there's something. Um, this year, we've got several big somethings, and it's <laughs> it has um, it definitely flavored the work for the year. But this is why trying to find these common grounds that the uh, the promise of the digital agenda, the the promise of sustainability, and where that can take us, and the the shared uh, need to address those those issues, I think, is really held APEC together. 
for some of those of you who might have attended um, Anu Bradford, uh, was she she spoke here on and in, in her book on uh, the three digital empires. Um, I think this is particularly in the digitalization space. This is a very important um, context to think about because uh, you know, she, she makes the argument that the United States has a particular approach, a kind of market-based approach to digital governance. Europe has a much more rights-based approach and uh, China has a, a much more a kind of um, a command approach, if you will, kind of control kind of approach. And these three empires, is it possible to at all reconcile the three? I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm not one. I try to be optimistic, but but perhaps, uh, you know, within an APEC framework where you have um, the different approaches to digital governance present at the table, perhaps APEC could be an important venue for, and you've already mentioned it, the digitalization issues and governance issues, data privacy and all of that. That these are new areas, these are frontiers of right. uh, of activity, and that's where there's not a path that's well trod already. That APEC can sometimes help find the way that might be different than Europe's way. And if the if the economies of APEC get together, they're quite a a strong voice. This is how the Information Technology right. Agreement came to be: is out of APEC because it could yeah. uh, carry enough leverage. The ITA, the Information Technology Agreement. If you never heard of it, and it's ages ago that this happened, but it was um, an important agreement that really APEC was the catalyst for it, and it became an important global agreement on information technology trade. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, uh, Chang, if I might. The big, how should I say, elephant question in the room, of course, is the expectation that at this APEC meeting, uh, Xi Jinping will be attending. It's not yet certain, we still don't know. But then in some ways, the expectation is focused or expectations for the APEC San Francisco meeting and the media tends to be focused on the potential of a Xi Jinping, uh, Joe Biden uh, meeting on the sidelines or maybe a full blown summit of some sort. Um, first, how does China regard APEC in general? And how do you see Beijing regarding this particular APEC meeting, given that it's hosted by the United States? And then lastly, what are you hearing about Xi Jinping attending or not? Okay, three questions. Uh, before answering them, also I want to join Monica to thank Alice for organizing this one and for you to moderate. Uh, it's really an honor to speak along with Monica and also speak to this distinguished audience. And thank you all for coming uh, to participate in this very timely, important uh, discussion. Um, first of all, uh, the first question, I think China has been a, a strong and enthusiastic supporter for APEC and for other multilateral forum, as long as China is a member, not so much about the G7 and et cetera. Um, for China, that um, uh, certainly they have a concern. The concern is that um, um, uh, it's, they would deeply worry about the US-led coalition against China and use Asia Pacific. So for them, it's not so much of Asia Economic Cooperation, you know, APEC, but rather Asia Pacific military confrontation, which is led by some of the Washington policymakers who want to promote this kind of US-led military alliance against China. So this is certainly explain uh, their concern and worry and they believe that the Washington has not been consistent in terms of the messages. And uh, um, the, the narrative, the dominant narrative in Washington um, is very much like the, the return of the bifurcation or polarization, or you are using your term, uh, decoupling. This could occur in many uh, domains. I remember 
almost a two and a half year ago, I gave a talk first at the um, uh, University of Toronto, where I served as the uh, a distinguished fellow, but also later at the Brookings. I list the worry that the 10 domains of divide. Let me uh, very quickly um, uh, go back to these 10 domains. And uh, this is the, the talk about the, the, some of the uh, development. At that time, Ukraine war did not occur. And certainly the horrific uh, the tragedy in the Middle East did not happen. And also the worry about the uh, Taiwan Strait crisis also was not an agenda. But at that time, already you see that um, you know the uh, kind of thinking uh, in terms of threat and the bifurcation of the world resulting in two confrontation block. One led by uh, China, Russia is the follower. The other is led by United States. This is so-called democracy versus aut autocracy, uh, this kind of narrative. Now the 10 domains are included. Number one, I just read this 10, the, uh, the list. <laughs> Number one, two trade and investment systems. Number two, two industry chains and the two supply chains. Number three, two oil, natural gas, and the new energy lines. Number four, two credit card payment system. Number five, two financial and the currency systems. Number six, two IT, 5G, and internet systems. Number seven, two satellite navigation system. Number eight, two outer space exploration programs. Number nine, to military and ideological uh, uh, blocks or simply a new Cold War. And number 10, a possible hot war in the AI era. Now, I thought that I was wrong, but uh, unfortunately, this trend mm -hmm. still can uh, continue. I fully agree with you that we live in an era is really should be multipolar and uh, neither bi uh, bipolar or unipolar uh, reflect the interests or serve the interests of the international community. But unfortunately, the, all these events, particularly Ukraine, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and uh, the tensions, growing tension, particular narrative that uh, today's Ukraine is tomorrow's uh, Taiwan, it's really, uh, I think it's the wrong narrative. And the thirdly, now the current, uh, the Hamas the terrorist attack. And um, of course, uh, each officer may have some different views. But uh, this is, uh, you know, I interpret it as a very uh, obvious uh, terrorist attack. It's really horrible things. But of course, with the overreaction, this is a different matter. It could be, uh, you know, based on the current information that uh, Wang Yi may have a good point uh, by talking about the both sides should restrain. Now, so these are the things put us in a terrible situation. So this is what China afraid. Now. There's also a consideration that uh, <coughs> uh, this is related with the, uh, the second or third question that uh, sounds like uh, Xi Jinping did not participate um, in the G20 meeting in India, and uh, he may not go to um, uh, San Francisco. But these are all, as you said, it's related with location, related with venues, not so much about uh, with China want to establish an alternative international order or start it's about uh, BRICS or extension of BRICS or the Shanghai cooperation. I don't think China uh, wants to do that. I think they still value heavily about uh, APEC, G20, but this is more to do with location. Now, coming back to the your yeah, question that uh, certainly there's encouraging development for capital members visit to China and the Schumann's visit, you know, and also Schumann said that, uh, you know, we uh, actually early on, he said that we should invite Jiang Li you know, but the things, the whole thing is lost in the U.S. congressional uh, debate or discussion, and also that um, uh, the California governor's forthcoming visit. This sounds like paved the way or prepare Xi Jinping's possible visit. But the negative side is that uh, again I mentioned about the Jiang Li as a ban to attend. Certainly, uh, Beijing do not find the you know uh, Washington's position. And I think it's still negotiation going on, but also the hostile uh, environment. I remember that uh, uh, if Xi Jinping um, uh, uh, went to San Francisco, this will be the third visit as the president of China. And the last visit was uh, uh, 19, uh, I mean, so 2015. I was in Seattle, but it's quite a different atmosphere. 
and he visited the headquarters of first stop, visited the headquarters of Boeing, and uh, talked to Mark Zuckerberg in Chinese, and also later will receive in Washington, in Washington, in the state banquet. So this reminds us it's a, it's a kind of different era. I mean, it it's a, also tells us how much U.S. China relation change. So you can see that uh, he concerned about whether he can get the uh, respect, whether the, the narrative will be, you know, uh, the, the dominant narrative will change. Now at this moment that they haven't announced yet, my view is probably 60% he will go. You know, uh, it's certainly 10% increase after Biden said that he welcomed Xi Jinping and um, administration, particularly Schumann's uh, visit and et cetera. But uh, again, that uh, related with many, many factors. I think China certainly wanted to uh, have some bargaining power and uh, regarding that, uh, what I perceive early on. Again, I say that it's not necessarily my view, but uh, this is one to share with you my observation of Beijing's position why they hesitant to make a commitment to visit, because although China, as I said, it's also China's interest to this multilateral forum, because all the, uh, the, the, the things, the three eyes, as Monica said, interconnectedness, uh, innova innovative, and inclusive, inclusive, these are the things that China, at least the, in the official narrative, they favor these kind of things. This is certainly the agenda, sustainable development, energy security, food security, digital economy, I mean, and also the arms, arms control and the peace. These things, at least the Chinese people, uh, leaders talk a lot. They don't want the Cold War return or decoupling. Of course, we can challenge some of the Chinese policies. Uh, the, the, at least the, the official narrative differ, differ profoundly from Washington, still obsessed with decoupling and uh, with supply chain you know, uh, move. Even sometimes the Washington leaders, including Biden, said, oh, we're not decoupling with China. But you look at the policies, not decoupling. Right. Right. So that things make China hesitant. So this is my current assessment. There's still a good chance. If so, should <clears> be announced very soon, next week or so, because the Belt Road I mean, meetings is going on in China. Putin is visiting Beijing. Right. There's also a lot of other high-level meetings will happen and then Xi Jinping will meet with some foreign delegations and et cetera. But uh, again, the ultimate decision probably will be made shortly uh, next week, um, if not early. But at the moment, the sign is not entirely clear. And I visit Beijing, I ask the officials, at that time they said 50-50. At the moment, I think it probably 60 to 40, but still <laughs> right. it's not uh, there too much, they, they move on. This is my answer to your question. My view would be that, I, I would agree with you, when my view is that if the U.S. really wanted to ensure that Xi Jinping would come, they would send an invitation to John Lee, and that oh. would be a catalyst to do it. I mean, it's just, if, if they really wanted uh, to secure Xi Jinping, I think that would be, an, in some ways, an easy way to <laughs> but, do it. Uh, uh... Monica, you, what do you think? You are in a different <laughs> Washington. It's, you are not in Washington, D.C., uh, let me tell you that certainly that uh, four cabinet members, particularly General Yellen and uh, Commerce Secretary visit are very, very productive. They established two working groups. One is the uh, Treasury, <laughs> yes. one is uh, uh, the Commerce. There are a lot of things going on because the U.S. business co co uh, community and the Chinese business community, international business community, really wanted to see some kind of improvement in the relationship. It's everyone's good news. Chinese leaders certainly understand that. But the Washington atmosphere is very different. I mean, um, over the past three or four years, there's one thousand, over 1,000 bills on China. Yes. Of course, not all of them went yes. to the committees. Yes. And, uh, but some went to the committee, some actually signed by president. And those signed by president <laughs> are very, very hawkish on China. Even put Xi Jinping's name in some of the, some of the bills. So that's, that's uh, again, that kind of atmosphere and particularly the push for Taiwan, and uh, from Chinese perspective, already you know passed the red line and etc. Now Xi Jinping visited the uh, U.S. He will not uh, have uh, you know have the similar reception like uh, you know eight years ago that I witnessed. So many business leaders, so many celebrities want to meet with him, get a ticket for a big event. I was in Seattle event and also 
um, uh, uh, shaking hands with him. I represented the Brookings at that time, our president did our goal. And uh, so that's the atmosphere, but now it's a quite a different right. atmosphere. Right. So, and also the event in San Francisco, the, 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 the truck, that the car attack, uh, that raised a serious concern about security issue. Yes. Right. And uh, so some tech is not important, but it's also relevant. So all these factors will be evaluated and the judge. You certainly, um, of course, Xi Jinping has incentive to go because most Chinese elites like the relationship to be improved, right? And for various reasons. And also for Xi Jinping, that um, to handle the, the major power relation is certainly very, very important. Although he knows that even the, that the chip is successful, but the next year will be election, then who knows that uh, which party will be White House. So anything will not be last, lasting. So he should calculate all these factors, then make a judgment. I think the surest way to ensure, to make sure that Xi Jinping does not go is by inviting Chai ing -wen to come. <laughs> no, no, this is, uh, this is probably not a lot of happen. Uh, a lot of legislators <laughs> in the United States have been pushing yeah. um, the Biden administration to uh, invite. So uh, just for, again, information for those who, who, who might not be following, um, <laughs> Uh, previously, Taiwan's representative has, has never been the, the, the president of Taiwan, but has been uh, either a senior official or retired official. And in the last few years, it's been Morris Chang, the uh, chair of the um, TSMC, uh, has mm -hmm. been uh, he, uh, representing uh, Taiwan, or Chinese Taipei, as it's known uh, in, in the APEC context. Um, before I get back to you, Monica, um, I just want to ask Chang, Given the economic situation of China today, that you know, depending upon whom you read, I mean, it 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 it's anywhere from troubling to dire. Um, I never know whom to believe these days, but it would suggest, particularly if the mainland is interested in attracting more foreign investment. That APEC is like an is a natural place to go, given particularly the ABAC forum. Uh, a, a, for those again who may not know that there is um, alongside the APEC economic leaders meeting, there usually is what's called the APEC um, the CEO summit, the um, uh, APEC CEO summit, which is essentially the ABAC uh, conference that um, uh, brings together. Uh, business people, it would be a, 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 a set piece venue, a perfect platform for Xi Jinping to talk about uh, and, and to try to uh, lure the foreign investment that maybe so far since post pandemic period has been somewhat elusive. Um, well, China's economy is in trouble, but not die. I will not go that far. There are those who are, uh, and, uh, who are writing and it off. What yeah. you said remind me, uh, Barron's actually took notes uh, this morning yeah. and the check the Barron's uh, magazine. Um, this is about the September. The, this uh, one title said, uh, China is in trouble, but it's not a disaster. Don't rush, scared. Don't run scared. But there's one line caught my attention. <clears throat> um, there, here's a line by the author. Um, he said, uh, she said, those ready to write off China underestimate the resources of Chinese policymakers and the power of an 18 trillion economy that is home to 1.4 billion people. Right. So think about that. China is still the largest market in the world, the uh, largest uh, middle class market. And uh, earlier I said that China is in economic trouble, private sector not doing well. And uh, um, IPO in Hong Kong going that way. I mean, property um, situation is terrible. Why right? you cannot make money? You can. Uh, this is no longer a driver. The only uh, exception is people said that you know, fang, uh, fang si, gu si are terrible. Stock market and the property market are terrible. But the evening market is fantastic in China. You know, right. I just had a. Had a coffee with the CEO of um, Xie Chen, uh, China trip just a few days ago. 
I was in Guang, uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou so a few days ago. Even when market is booming, the the touristic uh, tourism already returned to 2018, 2019. So that's a wonderful sign. But uh, these small businesses are probably not uh, like a stock and a, a property. Uh, but my point is that, of course, that the unemployment is another uh, uh, serious problem. Although we need to be careful because uh, the the young people, unemployment is almost 20% or even more. Uh, that's huge. But the overall uh, in unemployment is only 5.2 compared with 8% in, in 1998. So we should put it into perspective. Now, of course, China's economy and the Hong Kong's economy is not in good shape. I hope that China will open up with uh, mm. also to really attract foreign uh, investment, foreign trade, and et cetera. But the point is that um, Chinese government is not the only government obsessed with security. Which country is not uh, obsessed with security? Not to put security above economy, United States, Canada, uh, and uh, 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 India, and uh, Russia, China, they all put the security, Japan, and they all put the security at first at the moment. This is really terrible. That's what I said, that the, the move was moving, the world moving to a very uh, difficult situation. So the China's hmm. economic slowdown is not only attributed to the government policy, probably not so uh, forthcoming to help the private sector, right? But also related with many other fac uh, factors, structure change, still the legacy of the COVID. 19 is not far away, in the, just the early this year. And also the trade the war uh, by, by uh, Trump and the decoupling or value supply chain move. And also the narrative, the Taiwan situation, <laughs> right, just mentioning the crisis. And also the, the, the rhetoric about China already passed the peak and, uh, and, uh, or, or even die. Of course, I know that it's not your view, but it reflects <laughs> right. a lot of yes. people uh, in Washington. I think it's the wrong narrative. Now, the, ultimately, we should ask, if China is not good, where is the good? Europe, Middle East, India, United States? United States, of course, the economy is good. The five, six percent of the interest rate, you just put money in the bank. But is that sustainable? And US politics is already a serious concern. You look at that. I mean, uh, if we are optimistic about the 2024 election, I'm not. My view is actually, let me add one sentence. This could be provocative. I would believe the chance for Taiwan Strait war between China and the United States is much smaller than the civil war in the United States. I mean, it's a terrible situation. It's not the issues of who becomes the president. It's whether one party wins, the other party will Except if that become an issue, I think that's a serious concern. No, no economy, no company wants to invest in a place um, without stability. Right. So stability and infrastructure are crucial. But uh, you know, it's really fascinating. In these two areas, China has leverage. Right. Build a road initiative is really promote infrastructure. Now, China maintains stability. Now, of course, people may debate with me, but I think in the near future, Hong Kong and, uh, and China will maintain stability. Even that stability is achieved by authoritarian, you know, hardline things. We may not uh, like that, but uh, that's the reality. That's uh, currently with the problem in Western democracy. I'm afraid I'm a fan of Western democracy, but uh, I think it's fair for us all to think about what went wrong. Right. And I think, um, you know, I sometimes, I like to provoke people sometimes, I, I have to admit, uh, <laughs> that when we talk so much about de-risking nowadays, but it's always about de-risking with relation to China, but do we need to also think, particularly those of us on this side of the world, um, to think about de-risking relating to the United States, because <laughs> I think there are significant risks uh, uh, going forward. Um, Monica, if I can just go back to you, um, as putting on your hat as a, a spokesperson, if you will, uh, for the business community uh, in the United States that's focused on the Asia Pacific or the Indo Pacific, um, how do you see the this question about Xi Jinping and the relationship with um, 
with China and the United States, uh, particularly as the conventional wisdom nowadays in the United States is that China's on on the ropes in some respect that it's that it's having uh, economic difficulties and I know that inside the beltway there are those who who feel that well we should give them a knockout punch right or uh, take advantage of, of that uh, what, what are your thoughts on that geopolitical aspect of of of, of, of the coming meeting I mean APEC will media will definitely focus, particularly if Xi Jinping comes, on the U.S.-China relationship. Yes. First, I think it's more like a 75-25 chance <laughs> that, that he comes. Uh, I think uh, both sides want to make it happen, and they would like to see it, that outcome that they will have met and stabilized relations. I think that's a desire on both sides. Whether, um, you know, one week in U.S.-China <laughs> relations is a, is a, you know, an era. So we, we don't know that what can happen in the next three weeks or four weeks. But uh, I do think that that's a desire on both sides to to try to have that meeting and that stabilization of U.S.-China relations come together. I do also think, and it's important to say as somebody who lives in the other Washington, that it's been my experience that um, what happens inside the Beltway is not necessarily reflective of the rest of the United States and the people of the United States. And a good example is, uh, you know, this this meeting is going to be happening in San Francisco, which is on the cusp of the, the the Silicon Valley and the Bay Area and California, which is very Pacific facing, um, very, you know, the the relationship with the Asia Pacific, I think, is the reason why the business community agitated two years ago for the U.S. to raise its hand to host APEC, because I think they could say looking ahead. This is going to be important that the the future of all of our businesses, no matter what industry sector you're in, the future is in the Asia Pacific, in ASEAN, in you know, all of the APEC economies and even the Pacific economies of, of Latin America. So I think that's one piece of the puzzle. But you're, you're absolutely right. This is, um, you know, there are some forces in Washington which, um, and it doesn't speak with one voice. That's another thing I wanted to say. Yeah. So you say Washington thinks this or the Beltway thinks that. The uh, voices, as you can tell, even sometimes within one party can be extremely divergent. And um, we right now don't have one side of our congressional body that isn't in functioning because they don't have a speaker. Um, and I think that was all the more important that that Senator Schumer led led the group that he did over, over to China. So from from my perspective as a person who who focuses on international affairs and from the Seattle side, which was you know we're Pacific facing as well, often sometimes the the uh, Beltway does not reflect what um, what the general population of the United States thinks. But I also think that there's not uh, actually a very smart congressman Rick Larson, who you probably have heard of or know said one time, and I'll never forget, he just said this when he was asked, tell me about you know, U.S.-China relations. And he said, there's not one single U.S.-China relations. It's a, it's a, it's a, a tapestry. It's, you know, there's many, many threads, many different ways in which U.S. and China are, interact with one another. And while there are parts where, yes, there are disagreements, there are other parts where there's great cooperation, there's, there's unity of thought in, in certain things. And I say the sustainability area is one of those where there's been a lot of alignment um, and a lot of, of common ground. Uh, so I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit Pollyanna, but not, I don't go to 80, 20, I do go to 70. <laughs> right. Well, Rick Larson is a congressman that we should all in Hong Kong be thinking about and supporting because he is a sponsor with two other Democratic congressmen of a bill to reinstate the uh, Fulbright program to the mainland and to, to uh, Hong Kong, uh, which I think is a, an, an important initiative that requires some support, but uh, sadly um, is not moving forward at the moment in the current Congress. Uh, any questions for uh, Chung or for uh, Monica? Yes, please. And uh, my name is Andrew Leung. First of all, thank you very much indeed for the panel, for these interesting remarks. Um, it's right that um, uh, there is um, um, a tendency uh, to try to moderate or, or scale down the kind of tension between the United States and China. Uh, but then both parties in the United States do speak with one voice on China. 
and then against China. In fact, the both parties are trying to outdo each other on confronting China. Now, bearing in mind that APEC is for cooperation, and whereas the geopolitics is about rivalry, is about confrontation. So how do business people uh, on the APEC forum uh, negotiate this minefield, particularly a lot of the sanctions, a lot of the tariffs, they are enshrined in U.S. legislation. You're talking about the entity list, for example. Uh, you're talking about tariffs, uh, regulations, and you're talking about all sorts of uh, regulations governing uh, this kind of country-to-country um, uh, -country relations, particularly between the U.S. and China. So how do business people negotiate uh, these kind of uh, barriers uh, in the APEC forum? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Monica, uh, what, what are you hearing from your uh, constituents? Well, I think a lot of the um, the, the business people have indeed you know, broadened the number of places where they're operating in Asia. There's been a lot of uh, new activity in, in Vietnam, um, a lot of activity in Singapore, and, and you've all seen that. There's, there's changes in movement. Uh, from different companies, but I don't know of anyone that has basically said we give up on China. I think that would be a, a fool's errand, and I think that was what um, what uh, Chang was getting to a little while ago. That the the person that uh, ignores China, they do so at their at their peril. It's a folly to do so. So I think there's those one of the, the arguments that the A back often makes on tariffs and things like that is that. You know, big companies like Boeing, who you mentioned before, they have lawyers that can figure out how to get, or, you know, to figure out what to get through tariffs or to fill the right paperwork in or whatever. It's the small businesses, which Hong Kong has so many of. I and mean, it's that these small and medium enterprises that don't have, you know, teams of lawyers working on all their different um, customs documents. You know, they're the ones who really suffer when these kinds of uh, things are in place. And if we don't facilitate the movement of, goods and people and, and capital across the borders. I think it's, they're the ones who really suffer more. Just want to add, add one thing, that um, the economic globalization we have been familiar with, you know, started 1980s, came to end. Now the world is dominated by anti-globalization movement, particularly in Western countries, but also in other parts of the world. And um, the economic disparity within and between countries in large. And uh, China certainly um, benefited greatly from economic globalization. So sometimes I'm worried Chinese people may not be may not have the empathy to understand, you know, why there's a very strong anti-globalization sentiment, especially in the United States. Um, the, remember that uh, when Biden was a candidate, he talked about the immediately he became president, he would lift the, the trade tariff, but never happened. Why? Because American working class believe that uh, this is only benefit from, benefit for corporate America, Wall Street. So ordinary people, blue workers, blue color workers, they did not benefit. Uh, these people become strong supporter for Donald Trump. So that things completely change from 30 years ago, uh, you know, or 20 some years ago, they benefit cheaper products from China. So I think this is a challenge uh, for Beijing as well. If China wanted to really uh, to do well in the future, the sensitivity about the, how the Western country, global south, uh, whether they can benefit from China's development. That's a very, very important issue. Uh, China's middle class from zero to the largest over the past 30 years, but the time that in Europe and then North America is shrinking. Now, I do believe that China's development could benefit from the some neighboring countries, some neighboring countries, and the Belt Road uh, Initiative probably also benefited these countries. But the Western countries, they did not see it. And instead, they see the very aggressive approach in terms of even EVs, electronic vehicles. And um, now United States, they said to not see that the China's growth, whether we benefit, us. but most Chinese believe that uh, we are in trouble, that the Chinese economy is in trouble. So that kind of a lack of empathy, lack of global thinking, um, or lack of incentive to make the uh, cake bigger, 
is an issue. So precisely at this moment, we need the international cooperation. We need this kind of forums, whether G20 or APEC or many other, or even a BRICS and extension. I think this multilateral forum organization should play a very, very important role. But unfortunately, that the other narrative, what I call the bifurcation, polarization, also have a huge market. I hope that um, um, uh, if the Ukraine war ended, European countries may get out of this kind of fear or, or animosity. I think international community will, will look at China, look at the United States in different light. So, but until then happen, but unfortunately what happened the past couple of week, uh, weeks uh, add a new dimension about the, 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 the terrible you know, challenges we face. So I think all these things remind us um, we, uh, the, the, the major powers should cooperate rather than just uh, in that confrontational course. That's why. So yeah. I think for US, I think this is also an opportunity to review our new uh, 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 you know, strategic uh, framework, which adopted actually uh, in the last few years of the uh, Trump administration that uh, the, the uh, I think 2017, 2018, State Department and uh, DOD released two reports. They think that the order of the threats from terrorism, rogue state like uh, Iran, North Korea, and the geopolitical uh, challenges like uh, China and uh, and uh, Russia uh, now reverse to that the China is the number one enemy. I think that uh, uh, all this should be subject to debate. But unfortunately, we do not see any kind of discussion. So you are right. Both parties all put China as an enemy. This is actually happened in a short period of time. I remember 2020 election, Biden team, Democrats team, they at, the, at the, that time, they treat China and Russia differently. But now, within three years, they put China as the, the most formidable enemy. <laughs> That's a very, very dramatic shift. Other questions? Um, yes, please, sir. Hi, I'm Tohan Shi, a risk consultant and a part-time freelance journalist. Um, today, Xi Jinping is going to give a big speech on the opening day of the Belt and Road Forum. And it's been 10 years of the Belt and Road Forum. How do you see the Belt and Road Forum as it stands now? And how do you see it in the years ahead? The Belt and Road Initiative, sorry. Yeah. Ching Li, yeah. oh, well, this is not a um, choice, but a necessity. Because China uh, cannot sustain by itself. China lack of resources. China needs foreign market. And um, I think if Deng Xiaoping live now, he also will promote this kind of approach. This is again, uh, a China lack of resources, lack of you know, uh, all these things. So um, that's the, now of course there's some problems uh, with Build the Road Initiative, but the, that problem in my view, uh, compared with the, um, the infrastructure development, I think that um, it's relatively small now, but I think, I think the Chinese government need to address some of the challenges, some of the problems um, in terms of you know, the, 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 the people in the Western country criticize. But overall, I think it's, a, uh, it's quite successful from Chinese perspective. Uh, but that's in, in certain areas, for example, that uh, you talk about railroad, you know, deliver things to Germany and yeah. etc. But this is all combined together, not like a ship business. So whether uh, how to evaluate this kind of approach, you know, this kind of. So I think there's some room for improvement, and particularly should make sure the other countries can benefit. It's really win-win. The same things early on I talk about the when Xi Jinping and the other leader talk about win-win. The many Western critics said that this means China will win twice. Right? Mm -hmm. So that will not work. So certainly there's also a concern from the built world uh, countries. But overall, I think even some of the US government officials, um, they said, you know, maybe publicly or maybe privately, the built world initiative from Chinese perspective, actually uh, it's more productive more you know, uh, rewarded than the other way around. Not like someone said, it's a failure. I certainly do not buy the built road, it's a failure. And also do not buy, it's a choice, but I think it's a necessity. Now, whether it should improve, of course. 
um, the, the weather will continue. Sounds like it will, and uh, probably even will reach a different level than whether you call Bill to roll the initiative with different things. Mm -hmm. But I think that the Chinese leaders should be more articulate, more sensitive about uh, the, the, the various countries. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I mean, just from my perspective, I, 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 I'm constantly surprised by, I mean, when I was working in the Canadian government, uh, I think today, if I'm not mistaken, the Canadian government still has no official policy or stand on the Belt and Road because, for whatever reason. But I mean, I think that the uh, a, a lot of outsiders look at the Belt and Road and they think, oh, this is some kind of grand scheme that was so well thought of that in 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 Zhongnanhai, and it's some kind of like um, uh, scheme for world influence and domination. I, you know, I I don't think that was it at all. That. Uh, like many things that come out of the mainland, that there was some kind of big idea. And then let's see how it's executed on the ground in different manners and see what works and what doesn't. And then we improve as as we go around. I mean, think, I think that's generally how the Belt and Road was kind of uh, rolled out and how it's played out. And there have been, of course, um, many or some kind of... Um, uh, uh, some, some criticism, particularly coming from the United States, and also about debt trap diplomacy, and uh, you know they 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 refer to Hamban Tota in Sri Lanka as the you know the flag uh, the the uh, poster project for that kind of debt trap diplomacy, and I think just the in the weekend uh, the Pokhara Airport in Nepal was written about uh, in the New York Times, and 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 these are kind of interesting cases, but I don't think it's a um, um, it, the idea that the Belt and Road is some kind of devious, cunning plan to, you know, get the world in its in China's thrall, I agree with you completely that the motivation for Belt and Road is very much domestic economics. It's a matter of a shifting overcapacity in mainland elsewhere. How do you source new growth? You source new growth by being able to trade more with your partners all across the world, but you can't trade more with them if they don't have good infrastructure. So let's help them build infrastructure so we can trade more with them. I mean, in some ways it's a, and, and there was also an aspect of internationalization of the renminbi. There was also a, an aspect of it, I think at the beginning, maybe that died out a little bit. Uh, but the, I, I think as with many things uh, related to um, foreign policy, there are domestic political, motive, domestic policy motivations uh, driving uh, these projects. And, and, and I think very much so uh, Belt and Road was, uh, was grounded in domestic policy um, motivations uh, uh, in Beijing. Um, any, any other questions before we... So I'm gonna close by asking um, Monica and uh, Chung, uh, Chung first, um, just looking ahead, 2024, we're entering a kind of possibly even more treacherous geopolitical environment with elections in many key elections in many countries. Um, just focusing on the US China relationship for you, um, what do you think? Uh, should we be more concerned about where we're heading than we are now? Or do you think that these so called guardrails are being set up? We have the working groups now. Um, but yet we're not having any mill-to-mill, -mill, military to military uh, discussions. Um, do we are you positive, negative, concerned? And you spoke about risks from the United States. Well, well I'm concerned. I think that uh, um I, I to see the world politics not in the zero sum fashion, uh, but rather uh, I would say if the <laughs> US in trouble, the world is in trouble. Just like if China is in trouble, also will affect the other part of our, our region, not the win, the, the zero sum game. Like uh, one person's loss is another person's gain. It's a, I do not buy that narrative. So therefore, I think China should be aware that the next year will be very, very tough. Right. Now, I do see the differences between Republican and the, and, the, and the Democrats, because in the final year, of the Trump administration because of the COVID out of control in the US, 
he really let the, those hawkish team, the so-called AR4, headed by Michael uh, Pompeo. Uh, they actually adopted four policies. One is completely decoupling. I do not want to go to detail. So differ from Biden's selective decoupling or precision decoupling. And the second is to uh, pursue regime change over through the Chinese Communist Party. Biden administration never say that. They are very disciplined. And the thirdly, talk about the uh, China threat as a whole society threat. Even uh, Donald Trump recently in the campaign, he said when he became president, he wanted to implement the idea that the ban the Chinese Communist Party member as a relative uh, to come to US. How many? Now it's 98 million Communist Party members and also altogether probably 300 million. Right. How do you even know they're family member of Chinese Communist Party? So they basically just ban Chinese. And, and uh, of course, <coughs> Biden administration did not take that. They still want to promote tourism and the student exchanges, although they are more uh, uh, tougher on stamps. You know, students. Right. Finally, Taiwan issue. Biden administration said repeatedly, we still have the one China policy. So differ from the other group. The, and the, so you see the differences. But uh, on the other hand, Chinese are very concerned about the Biden-led coalition building, you know, with the uh, European country, with ASEAN countries, and particularly with Japan and the South Korea in recent months, right? right. So that gives tremendous pressure on China. So among these, uh, you know, uh, two parties, I mean, it's very difficult for China to choose. Of course, they do not want to tell us what they choose. But uh, my view is probably they prefer Donald Trump, not so much about uh, he will put the U.S. in chaos, but rather that a uh, uh, leader is more what's called a chance. Uh, uh, everything's a transition. Oh, oh, right. Chan yeah. What's what Chan say? Uh, what's the word? Transactional. You Transactional. So the Chinese Transactional. saying is any any problem can be solved by money. It's not a big problem. Right. So this is Chinese is probably mm -hmm. hope. Right. But the point is probably not the Donald Trump, but the young Republican. You then you look at all these people, they are very very hard line, very very ideological. So it's a tough situation for China. So that's why Xi Jinping think even you cut a deal with the current administration, the whole thing will be gone with the climate change right. or with the, with the <laughs> maybe regional yeah. security and et cetera. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica, if I can just close with you um, just briefly, uh, let's bring it back to APEC. Um, and what, you know, going forward, what do you hope will be the outcome from this uh, APEC cycle? And just looking forward, um, APEC moves to Peru uh, next year, and kind of the unwritten or unspoken, um, well, sense is that um, when it goes to Latin America, it's a weak APEC year. Uh, this is the cynicism uh, that sometimes comes, creeps in among journalists that cover APEC. But um, just your closing thoughts on what we can maybe expect and what your best hope is coming uh, next month and then going forward to 2024 in APEC Peru? Well, I think that first of all, next month, I think um, if I can just be the Pollyanna of, of all time and say, uh, you know, it, Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping comes, a successful meeting is had, moderating some of the, the challenges. I think we're going to have a spectacular CEO summit. I think the the leaders will have uh, plenty on their 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 books, and I think San Francisco will put on a shining show. You, those of you who haven't been to San Francisco in a while or have heard read stories about San Francisco, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised by what you hear out of APEC. At least that's my my dear hope. Um, moving on to to Peru, what's been really uh, interesting is Peru hosted in 2008 and in 2016, and they've raised their hand again. And having done this now this year. 11 or 12 years after we did it in 2011 and knowing how hard it is it's really something that they in there and have had a really rather tumultuous couple of years in their political cycle it's really i think remarkable that they have raised their hand again they are committed to this pacific view from from peru and they do a marvelous job when they host apec as far as the the events and and logistics and even some of the the um you know some of the the substantive initiatives that they put forward and they have been working very closely already with the US and actually with Korea which is the following year's host 
to try to come up with these things that can build as the U.S. built on the, the Bangkok goals, then they, they can build on the U.S. goals, and then Korea can build on the Peru goals. So I think that's the very operational part of APEC will continue to roll along, whether or not the, the geopolitics says it should be. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much. In fact, I would point out that Peru, along with Chile and Mexico, are um, members of the CPTPP, which I think is the gold standard of trade arrangements, despite whatever I anybody says. Um, and I so agree. I think that that's a very important aspect uh, going forward. So um, thank you very much. I hand it well, back to Al. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, uh, Chen. And thank you, Monica from Seattle. I'm really, uh, well, thank you for a wonderful discussion. And I just want to wrap up, um, as I was saying, uh, I think the chair of APAC, uh, the Business Council, the uh, Asian business in the, United, in the U.S. is uh, one of our own C100 member, uh, also from Hong Kong, Dominic Ng. And Dominic yes. has spoken for Asia Society uh, Hong Kong here many times. So we hope to have Dominic back. He's chair of East West Bank. So we have uh, uh, Dominic who, uh, and also just FYI, after hearing um, Monica, I think I'm going to side with Monica. I think it's going to be 75, 20. <laughs> and the reason is, uh, last week we, I was at a, a curator's forum with, uh, another Shanghai niece, uh, uh, Jay Xu, director of the, uh, Asian art museum. And he was telling us, uh, Asian art museum, they're cleaning up, you know, um, all the homeless will be gone. And they are getting ready to welcome the first ladies. And he kind of dropped hint that he might have a Shanghai first lady uh, joining him for APEC. So based on what Jay said uh, uh, last week, I, I I think I'm siding on the odds with with Monica here. And uh, but you know we could be wrong. But I, regardless, I think it's really important uh, to have this discussion. And uh, taking bets at the back. We are taking bets. And uh, <laughs> and you know hey. The, if if we win, you know, lunch on eight, you know, if you guys win or if, whoever wants to take the bet, it's lunch at Asia Society, right? So, but anyway, <laughs> but thank you all for being here. Again, I want to thank all our three speakers and uh, and look forward to seeing you um, at future Asia Society events and uh, and go check out the exhibition. And thank you all for being with us. Thank you. <laughs>